part three. Here we go. Uh, so once again, this is our little uh, fossil. It's going to be Paragasiocrinus teri, and I'm using this as an example to show you kind of what to do. It's going to be a little different from your one, but uh, yeah, everything we're going to do, we're going to follow the same steps. So part three, let's go have a look and see what this is. So I'm in Blackboard, I'm in the Group Project folder, and da 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 there we go. Part three, start with a fancy word called biostratigraphy. So what that means is figuring out exactly what time things or um, what time different beds of rock come from based on the kinds of fossils that you have in them. And so most species don't last very long. The ones that leave a good fossil record and are pretty normal, it's normally something like a million years. And even at that, that's probably a little longer than most things uh, actually last. Um, so the way that we figure out the two beds of rock, like here and Kansas and maybe even Ohio, are from the same age is if we can find the exact same little critter and we know the critter has a fairly narrow window in which it lived, then we can correlate those rocks from different places. So that's going to be kind of the goal of what you're going to be doing with this section. So you're going to figure out when your fossil lived using Google Scholar and references provided on Blackboard, and I'm going to tell you where I found uh, your fossil. So in this case, our fossil is from a thing called the, let's see, the Upper Salesville Formation. And so we'll go figure out what that means. Um, so I think the first step in here is that you're going to go out and get my Jacksboro species list, blah, 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 Excel file. And so that is also found on Blackboard. In fact, you can just scroll down a little bit here. Let's pull that screen up so you can see it. There we go. Jacksboro species list, blah, 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 blah. It's named that for some other reason. Um, let's pull this up. And I've already got it open, so I can't open it twice. So let's just open it. There we go. And it should open up on this one. Now, if yours doesn't open up on sheet four, then sheet one, two, three, four. Four is the one you want. Uh, one and two and three have other things on there that aren't really going to be of any use to you, but uh, they're useful to me. So what we've got here is a little time scale. So in column A, we've got a little time scale, and I'm dividing up geological time into different little bands. These different little packets are each about 400,000 years, we think. Neighborhood up. <laughs> But the really important thing is that we can correlate uh, different parts of the country. And so we have a Texas column here. That's the one you're going to find really useful. And so if you're uh, looking at the Talpa formation in Texas, why that would be about the same as the Rayford limestone, which is going to occur out in uh, sort of Kansas, Nebraska area. And all of these things, every single one of these entries has been correlated, usually with more than one different kind of fossil. And the most common fossils that they use for this are two little things. One's called a fusilinid. It looks like a grain of rice, and it's a little crazy foraminifera. It's one of these um, creatures in the group called the SAR that I think you're going to remember. Um, and the other way that they do it is with uh, creatures called conodonts. And it's like a little toothy eel. Here, let's get a picture of a foraminifera. There we go. So these are some little foraminiferas. That's great. And we want a conodont. And so the animal, yeah, let's get our images going here. The animal looks like that, a little sort of bug-eyed, goofy eel. It didn't actually have a jaw, but it had a bunch of teeth set down in its throat that we think it used to grab on things and just kind of rip them up. These are some of the teeth, and here's a nice full set of the teeth. And so the nice thing about these is that they lived everywhere around the world, and they changed really fast. So you've only got, you know, you know at most maybe like a million year window, where if you find a specific tooth that looks exactly like that, then you know exactly what time uh, your rocks come from. So that's kind of a neat thing. And together, these are biostratigraphy. So, all right, let's go and have a look. Da, 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 da. So we're going to find our formation on the Jacksboro species list. And remember I told you it was the Upper Salesville formation. And so let's just grab part of that word, Salesville, and see where that is. And bam, there we go. Salesville shale is equal to the Upper Salesville formation. I think uh, here's the Lower Salesville down here. And so we probably should have written Upper Salesville up there, but what do you know? 
And so this is going to be in the bracket that's called M2. Okay, so that's neat. Um, what these stand for, D is Des Moinesian, like Des Moines, Iowa. M is Missourian. Um, and V is Virgilian, named after a ghost town in Kansas. And these three are at the top of the Pennsylvanian subperiod, which is part of the Carboniferous, if you live in Europe and like that sort of thing. Um, then up here, this is the line between the end of the Carboniferous, or the end of the Pennsylvanian, and the start of the Permian. And then we got a little subperiod uh, that the Permian is broken into, and the little divisions of those subperiods. So that's what uh, all these little names mean. So we're looking for something that is around M2 in age. And so we're going to go figure out exactly what that means. And so to do that, we're going to go to the next uh, little bit here. So read the paper by Heckel 2008. Well, it just turns out that I have this thing open already. So we don't want that one. We want da, 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 that one. There we go. And this is an interesting paper because this guy is going through and for all of mid-continent North America, which is um, if you were to draw a sort of a, I don't know, like a diamond shape between Pennsylvania and Colorado and New Mexico and um, like Texas, Arkansas area. So connect that giant thing up. That is the mid-continent area. So pretty big. And the way these formations get named is that if you have a formation in your backyard, we'll call it the Your Backyard Formation. And that's great, until we figure out exactly what it lines up with. Um, and then as your friends start to drill their uh, fracking oil wells, they'll take out these little cores of rock. And a uh, geologist will be able to read that rock out and say, ah, oh, it's limestone here, and then it goes to shale and whatever. There's all different names for the kinds of rock. And it'll be able to look for these little tiny fossils in there and be able to correlate exactly what layers your formation is sitting on top of or is sitting under. Um, and so as you're reading through the paper, he's going through and telling you that, oh yeah, look, here's the uh, mid-continent sea. So it was a kind of a shallow ocean that was sitting on pretty much everything that is America now. So to get you oriented, this is Canada right up here. Here's Greenland. It's, it has yet to sort of move. It's going to float out that way. And right over here, just barely across the ocean, uh, the UK and Ireland were really close to all these other things. And all these things were on, or pretty close to, the equator. So here's the equator right here. And if you see that right there, these are uh, the Great Lakes. So Ohio is sitting right there. There's an O8. There's an Illinois. There's Kansas down here. Utah is over there. And so Texas is going to be right around in this area. And so that means Texas is underwater, it's the ocean, and it is pretty darn close to the equator, which, yeah, runs through Ohio for some reason uh, during this particular time. Now, just before this, there was actually an ocean channel that connected all the way across. So Ohio was connected all the way over here to the Alps. Uh, basically, uh, Spain is right over here. And so you do get the same fossils in northern Spain that you find in southern Ohio. <laughs> Um, but that's a few million years before that, and now this thing has, um, the land has risen up in here. We've got our Appalachian highlands, and so, uh, yeah, so we're now separated, and the species are starting to diverge on either side of it. Anyway, the thing you really super duper want, and there's a lot of good stuff in here. This will really explain better than I can what's going on. So the other thing that um, he has done, Phil Heckel, is he has gone out and figured out a way to measure water depth. And it turns out that particles get distributed differently depending on how deep the water is. You can think of this in terms of a river. So if a river is moving uh, big, medium, small, and tiny rocks along, and like the tiny ones are just like dust, how far are they going to go? Well, the big rocks going to probably fall right at the end of the river or may even sit in the river. It might not even get pushed out into the ocean but then closest to the, where the river drops off, so the very beginning of the delta where it's touching the river, you're going to have the big heavy sediments, and so that's going to be a marker of fairly shallow water, fairly near to shore. If you get out over the really deep ocean, what you find um, then and now is that you, only the tiniest particles will stay suspended in the water, and then eventually they'll sort of drop out. So if you were to go out over the center of the Gulf of Mexico right now, you would find teeny tiny little particles just barely raining down, one or two atoms at a time. 
and landing on the um, bottom. And that's the stuff that makes shale. And so if you find rock that's made of stuff like that, you can tell it was deep. Or if you find stuff that's made of sand and big chunks of things, then you can tell it was pretty shallow because that's the only place where you get it. Sand occurs at the beach. It doesn't go all the way out in the water. <laughs> you go too deep and you're just in mud. And so here is the sea level. And the sea level is rising and uh, falling. And so let's see, every time we go up to a peak over here, this is when the sea level is at its highest. And then every little trough is the sea level at its lowest. And he's going through and figuring out roughly the sea level throughout all of the uh, Pennsylvanian and the bottom of the Permian. Very useful. And he's also noticing that, you know what, in this time, there are these cycles. There, um, there's a time where it'll reach absolute maximum depth. And he figures out the reason for that. And so the reason for that's up in here, and it has to do with the sun and the way it wobbles as it goes, uh, or rather the Earth, and the way it wobbles in its orbit as it goes around the sun. Uh, it gets a little closer, a little farther away um, at different times. And so the temperature of the entire Earth heats up and cools down, which causes the uh, polar ice caps to melt and reform. So every time we've got a real deep water, that's when the polar ice caps have just disappeared. And every time we're down here, this is when it's cooled down just a little bit and our polar ice caps have reformed and all that water has gone up and set on uh, Antarctica again. So that's interesting, um, but it doesn't have the upper Salesville formation on here. and doesn't tell us where M2 uh, is going to be located. So now here is where he's going through and using other people's uh, papers. So conodont faunas, there we go. Um, and he's figuring out uh, exactly when uh, sort of mid-continent area, I think like Kansas, lines up with Illinois and lines up with uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so there we go. We've got correlations with the same fossils everywhere there's a diamond and correlations with little bands of coal that seem to have formed at the same time everywhere there's a little sea. So that's good. And we go further in this paper and boom, here is the meat of the thing. And so he's saying these are 400,000 year groupings. So it takes about 400,000 years for, this, um, for the wobble of the Earth to repeat. So for us to go from really close to really far to back to really close again and change the uh, temperature. And so here are our little uh, groups. So there's the Missourian stage, and that's where the M comes from. The D is for Des Moinesian, and the V is for Virgilian. So there's the whole uh, Missourian last 2.4 million years which is about six cycle groupings. So six times that we got to maximum depth and then back uh, to maximum shallowness again. And so each one of those groupings is going to be about 2.4 million years. And we also have a nice date. So we know that the base of the Des Moines is about 309.4 million years. So using basic math, you can say, okay, if that's 309.4, then this is going to be and remember, time is going to go, we're, we're talking millions of years ago, so it's like it's going to go backwards. So recent is 299, and oldest is going to be uh, 309.4. So we're taking steps toward the present. So from 309.4, we're going to go to 309, and we're going to go to 308.6, etc. And you're just going to keep going until you figure out where we are. And so M2 means the second one of these things in the Missourian, and so... There we go. It's going to be the Swope um, cyclothem cycle in the Missourian. And so it says, oh, here, that's very helpful. The base of the Missourian is 305.4, so that's right here. And so if you go up 400,000 years, that would put us at 305 million years, plus or minus about 200,000 uh, for our particular fossil, if it was from um, uh, the formation that I mentioned. So that's great. That sort of gets us our uh, time scale and sort of calibrates it. He also calibrates it actually across the entire globe, which is a heck of a lot of work and a heck of a lot of looking at tiny fossils. Um, but now let's go on to the next uh, part of this one. So we've got lots of parts here. So we read the paper by Heckel. Yes. And we're going to figure out what Texas would have been like when my fossil lived. Okay, so we'll figure that out uh, and how old it is from uh, nearest 0.4 million years. So general conditions, I would say you look in there and you read about the general conditions was the sea level rising or falling during this particular thing? Um, yeah, something like that. And we worked out how old it is. Great. Okay, and so next, we're going to use Boardman et al. 1989. So let's get our Boardman up here. And I think we need to open Boardman. So let's open it up. Boardman et al. 1989. And we want to use a specific part. The article starting on page 63. So, all right, great. Let's find it. Let's see, 63, that'll be this one. Glacial eustatic. Oh my 
goodness, curve. And so what this means is it's looking at sea level rises and falls for north central Texas, which is where all your fossils are going to be from. And biostratigraphic, so correlation of fossils, um, to mid-continent North America. So it turns out the barometer for North America, the thing that everything is calculated to is Kansas, because Kansas University has the biggest paleontology program. That's where they're just a paleontology powerhouse. And so they get to be the ones that everybody else is measured against. It's kind of like Greenwich for Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah, nothing special about it. It's just they got there first. And so everything else, we have to try and correlate it to um, that part of the uh, uh, upper Pennsylvania. So let's do that uh, on page 63. So there we go. And 94. So let's get back to page 63. Just a moment. There we go. That looks like the right article. And 63. Fantastic. And you see right here, once again, it is Philip Heckel. And now he's teamed up with Darwin Boardman. Yeah, it's a dream team. And they're going to go and figure out what's going on in Texas. So you can read through and figure out what they did and how they did it and uh, you know, um, kind of what the different rocks look like and how they decide how deep and shallow they are. And then this is the one you really need, figure two in this thing. So this is the uh, sea level rises and falls in Texas. And so um, they're doing this uh, in the opposite way. So when the water gets deep, these lines are going to be on this side. They're going to be really high over here. And when the water gets deep on the mid-continent, it's going to be really high over here, just to make it easy to draw a line between these two things. And so we've got two bumps that are just about at the same height. And we've got the same fossils in both. And so we can say, all right, the Wayland Shale is equivalent to the Deer Creek Limestone of uh, the mid-continent. Now, the thing that you want is going to be the Placid, or sorry, the um, Upper Salesville. There we go. And so there we go, Upper Salesville right there. It's going to say it's correlated with the, um, yeah, basically lines up right on the uh, Swope Formation, which in different places is called the Hush Puckney Formation. And so you're going to write these things down. You're going to write down Swope. And that's fine. And uh, yeah, then you can go back to your um, heckle and make sure that I got that right. Make sure that uh, these two things do line up. And there you go. So that confirms that Texas matches over there. And that's a good start. And then we've got to do in the other parts, we have to justify this. OK, so da -da 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 -da. so we confirmed where it is in heckle. Uh, let's assume we've done that. And then we're going to go in and we're going to look at the actual fusilinid fossils and the actual conodont fossils. And you're going to find one that actually lines up with your time and that actually correlates Texas with the rest of North America or some other part in the world uh, for some of these things. Um, and so Wallman 2013 is going to be our next stop. And here we go. Let's get Wallman out here. Do, 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 do. Where are you hiding, Wallman? Boardman. Wallman. There we are. OK. And so what Wallman did is uh, built on an earlier paper by Mistel. And so he's going all the way through the entire Pennsylvanian and the bottom part of the Permian, which is pretty crazy, and uh, lining up fusilinids. So these are the names of fusilinids that you get in the mid-continent. And so there are particular genera of fusilinids that you only find in certain places, uh, or rather certain times. Uh, and he's going to try and correlate Texas with those. And so if we go through here, oh, there we go. Look at that. So this is in the Illinois Basin, so that's not what we want. But Missouri, and that's our time. And so probably the things that we're finding in here, things like Tritocytes, that's probably going to be what we're going to look for in the uh, uh, Missouri in sort of stage one. And remember, we're looking for swope formation. That's going to be our uh, one for the mid-continent, or we're going to be looking for... Uh, Upper Salesville, if we're in Texas. Okay, and so we're still in Oklahoma here, and so every page you look where it is near Ardmore, that's fine. Da, 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 da. A few zones of Missouri, great. And a few zones of northern mid continent, that's fine. So mid continent, here we go. Missourian, and let's see if we can find the swope formation. Oop, do, 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 or swope like, ah, here we go. Remember this, swope limestone is this whole big brick, and specifically the Hushpuckney Shale. That is exactly lining up with where our thing was from. 
And so you're going to look here, and who occurs in the swope formation? Why? We've got these two guys. So Eo wearing Ella ultimatum. Wow, the ultimate Eo wearing Ella. Fantastic. And Fusilina um, Falls Ensis, uh, probably from the Falls Limestone, uh, which is located somewhere else. Okay, so let's uh, let's find one of these. Let's say we're just going to pick one. I'm going to go with Eo wearing Ella. So Eo wearing Ella. And we'll turn this on. No, we're not going to. Okay. And it's actually got pictures of all of these things. So if yours is better at uh, searching than mine, then you look through. And oh my goodness, look at those. That's what a fuselage looks like if you cut it in half. So if you cut it sort of uh, crossways, you'll see that. And if you cut it long ways, it'll look like this. And uh, depending on how many and what kind of these little uh, sort of crenulations you have between the layers and the overall shape, that's how they identify these things. There's usually a thing called a channel that looks like an X if you've got something like a Tritycides uh, is one of the common genera. So you can see this little dark X running through there. And so, ba -ba 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 -ba. Upper Pennsylvania Missourian. Nope, we're not there yet. We want kind of the bottom of the Missourian. And da -da 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 -da. Actually, we're probably up here. Anyway, we're going to look through and we're going to figure out exactly where our fossil occurs and we're going to take a picture of it. So let's imagine that imagine that this was our fossil, was number 14 here, and so then we would take a picture of it and so I'm going to get my usual screenshot app, but you're going to do it however it works best on your computer. And I'm going to grab all of this. Now look at that. So we've got it, we've captured it, but it's kind of messy. And so we can save it in our little presentation. Boom, boom. Okay, and it looks all right, but I don't know. I'm not sure if that looks tidy enough for me. So there's a couple things you can do. If you're working with PowerPoint, you can do a thing called crop to shape, or uh, it's like a mask. So let's picture format crop and in the little window here we can crop to shape and let's crop it to a round shape and then well, that's crop and so that will let you adjust it. That's a kind of an easy way to do it. If you happen to have something that's round, now if you got something that's weird shaped, then you gotta do something else. So that worked out pretty well, but let's just show you um, uh, an example of what you could do uh, otherwise. So and you don't have to do this next part, but if you want to make a really nice looking one. So let's pretend we were looking for number, um, yeah, number 14 again. And we'll just get some more trash here in the frame. And I'm going to save this uh, to my desktop as just a little file. Looking great. Okay, so a program you can get is called GIMP. And it's got a little dog icon. It's totally free. It is just like Photoshop. It can do everything that Photoshop can do. Uh, and it's free and you can install it if you have some kind of computer. So it is actually really cool and I recommend it if you want to make a really nice looking one. Now we're into kind of extra credit territory here, but why the heck not? Uh, so let's open up our thing. It's going to be on the desktop. It's going to be at the top. A little screenshot. There we go. And what you can do here, uh, you can get things like the magic wand tool and so you can sort of set it. I want to pick up a little more stuff. There we go and we can, there we are and we can just boom dissolve that background or if we had to we could go in and we could trace around something. And you can actually zoom right in and get a really good trace right around the edge. That's a terrible trace <laughs> but yeah if you want to make your thing look super duper spectacular. So it's an option. It's there for you. And yeah, let's see if anybody does it. Um, and then to uh, grab it out of here, we're just going to bump this up because we want to select everything. 255, bam. Oops. Uh, nope. 255. Uh, there we go. And cut. And we can paste it in. And bam, there we go, we paste it. Now this one actually has nothing on the corners, nothing on the edges. You can move it around, you can post other things uh, next to it, sort of paste it. And this one has a little bit of 
fluff around the edges. You can see it's got that extra little white zone. Not too bad for this particular fossil, but your mileage may vary. And anyway, now you know how to do it. Okay, so we're going to be taking pictures of a fuselage, and we're also going to be taking pictures of conodonts. Let's get our uh, conodont paper, which is going to be the other one. This is going to be Barrick et al. And so let's find Barrick et al. And I don't need you anymore, Mr. Wallman. There's Barrick. And so Barrick's going to go through and uh, let's see. Barrick knows these things. So there's our swope one. Okay, and so our swope is going to be I cancellosis. Okay, so let's find that. There we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, so um, its full name, the I stands for Idionaphodus, neat, and it says it's number uh, 10 here, so let's find number 10. And so bam, there it is, that's number 10. And if you were to find, and then remember these are little tiny teeth, and so the sort of jagged pointy part of the tooth is sort of facing straight up at you here. But um, this is the bit that's a little bit more like a fingerprint that uh, is a little easier to identify. And yeah, there's nothing else that looks quite like that out there. And so once again, we can do the same thing. We can uh, go in here and we can take a screenshot whatever way your computer has to take screenshots. I'm going to do it through my PDF reader, but uh, yeah, as you like. Okay, and save this as Idionaphodes. There we go. And we're going to take that into the GIMP, or we can take it into um, PowerPoint. And you see with PowerPoint here, if we were to just uh, insert that, our problem would be, let's see, picture from file, our problem would be that it would look bad. So desktop, Idionaphodes, there we are. Boom. So it looks kind of crappy, and yeah, you can get away with it. But if there's something inside your head that tells you, no, I want it to look nice, got to look pretty, then um, yeah, I, I think GIMP is going to be the thing for you. Now, we don't want to cut off any parts of the actual fossil, but we do want to cut off as much of that background fluff as we can. And so we got to OK. We didn't get to beautiful, but we're at OK. And OK can be OK. Uh, there we go. Bam, we'll put that in there. And so and then we have to make sure we put in a nice figure like this. So it's going to be figure uh, two, probably, is this one. This is going to go into the appendix. So you're going to have a written paragraph about what you're doing and listing all your references. And then we're going to have the appendix here. And so these are biostratigraphic. Oops. Uh, oops, um, biostratigraphic markers, and if you remember, my C key is not working, so embarrassingly we have to go up here and copy the letter C, and then we will paste it in, and then we will go and get ourselves a new computer once we get all these uh, videos up and running. Biostratigraphic, uh, there we go, uh, markers of the 